Hey everybody, welcome to another session of hashtag gather to grow. You're on food from Zanzi. I don't know if people still do that, but I, I decided just to do it because I'm usually awkward with these things. My name is Dawn Numdu. I am your host for this evening and I really can't wait to have this discussion. Thank you again for being here, for joining. Just to tell you more about the topic, we're talking crop diversification. I think this is something that we just all talk about. Oh, you have to diversify your farm in practice, what you do on farm level. You have to diversify. One of the farmers actually suggested this topic was like diversify or die, <laughs> which I think was a bit extreme. And he said he was being dramatic about it, but it's true. We'll focus just broadly around the benefits and the challenges of it. I think, again, it's something that people just say needs to happen. But what does it actually mean? And I think that's the gist of what the conversation will be about. My guest tonight, they've been on my sessions before on Gather to Grow. Kakiso is an agronomist and farmer. And then my other guest is Siabonga Vilakazi, and he is the Deputy Training Directorate for the KwaZulu Natal Department of Agriculture. Also one of the gems in the sector, really out there just doing the most. Advocate for development, developing farmers throughout his province, but also elsewhere. Sia, how are you? Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Maybe just as a way of introduction, maybe you can tell us a little bit about you, where your journey started in agriculture, how it's been going. I did mention your position earlier, but maybe for those who just joined us, um, this is Mr. Sia Bonga. Velakazi, he's a deputy. He's a deputy director for training director at the KZN Department of Agriculture. And so, yeah, maybe just a short introduction of you and more of the work that you do. As uh, Dawn has introduced me, I'm Siobhan Velakazi. I'm um, originally from Peter Maritzburg here in Gozulu Natal, residing in Mbali, but originally from Mbenge, a rural community here in Gozulu Natal Midlands. And my journey with agriculture started the very same department I work for now, KwaZulu Natal Department of Agriculture, as a student at Sadara College. Went on further working on the farm, being a technician, being involved in uh, student and farmer development initiatives and programs. Studied further, became um, a lecturer in 2013 at the very same institution. And um, 2019 was involved to be vice principal of the college. Um, yeah, that was in 2017. And then in 2019, an opportunity came um, for me to move further out of the province. And I was in the Western Cape, um, um, part of the Western Cape Department of Agriculture at Alsenberg College, uh, responsible for the higher education and training uh, programs, the BAGRIC and the diploma, namely, and I uh, returned back in the province in 2021. Yeah, I quite intensively involved in agriculture with uh, quite a bit of practical experience, uh, but day-to-day uh, -day basis involved in upliftment and development of, 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 of farmers and, and, and students. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> a wealth of knowledge, as I mentioned. Um, really contributing towards the sector beautifully. So thank you so much for, for being here and for allowing me to pick that beautiful brain of yours and all of the experience that you've had in the sector. Um, my other guest is Kahiso. Kahiso is an agronomist and farmer. You were supposed to send me your proper title. I wanted to give you like a full introduction. <laughs> I was going to be like, this man has done this, this, and the other. But I'm going to let you do that. Um, it's such a pleasure to have you with me in this, uh, in this live. We've also been engaging on topics in agriculture for a while now. Tell us about you. Hi, thanks Don, for inviting me and uh, my, my colleague who just uh, spoke earlier, Sia. So my name is Garisha. I'm a, I'm a farmer. I'm doing a um, uh, lot of stuff. Uh, I'm doing both goats, sheep, and uh, also plowing maize and soya. Mm -hmm. So I've been quite involved in agriculture. I've worked in corporate, but on the farming side of things, and I've been in the research institute, the ARC, where we're dealing with medicinal plants and and other indigenous vegetables. So I've also been involved in the youth development that is in agriculture, 
most might know the structure called the yard that's youth in agriculture and rural development mm-hmm. so i've been the secretary of the organization uh, in in Tony region here in, in victoria and also i've been involved in scouting and also uh, developing this uh, uh, i mean uh, combining it to actually form a national structure that people might know now that it's been uh, it, it's been going around and recruiting young people to join farming and just ideally giving them the experience that we have acquired over the years as far as land acquisition is concerned uh, how do you mobilize capital and also just for i mean uh, crop farming and, and and livestock farming in general what are the do's and the don'ts mm-hmm. and in a nutshell that's that's who i am i don't have much i don't want people <laughs> expectations no no expectations i just think that anyone worth you know just even if you do a small part it's worth celebrating that's always my take on it you know so i think yeah. that's that's definitely how i see things when it comes to everyone in agriculture basically all of you are just celebrities to me i'm just out your fan girling at everyone <laughs> um <clears throat> thank you so much for the comments um i see malik saying time to learn Malik from North of Pretoria animal production graduate currently studying plant production I farm spinach kale mustard lettuce and a small on a small scale looking to go large scale Malik go large scale we support you um yeah I'm so happy that you're here and willing to learn and just doing the most um diary of hazel also saying I'm a 17 year old was looking forward to being a farmer um so could you help me with my journey Of course this whole platform is aimed at just giving you information to grow to know more about where you want to place yourself where you want to go to in the sector all of these sessions that we do is basically for that so i'm so happy to have you with us 17 year old are you the youngest person here that's awesome um you should also go and check out agri careers um www.agricareers.co.za that will definitely give you like different avenues to go to of uh, different job streams in the sector which is really cool it's a really cool resource to also go and use our topic as i mentioned is crop diversification the benefits and challenges and i'm going to start with my first question which i'm going to ask you to answer is what is crop diversification and why is it so important in south africa's agricultural sector when we talk about it what do we actually mean just break it down for us please thanks crop diversification is i think in the context where you look overall at um, your main crop what you normally plant on an annual basis from year to year and you try and develop or incorporate obviously um diversity within your planting regime or your crop routine um in terms of the type of crops and the families from which those crops um come from and um you 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 don't necessarily move away from your main crop or the crop which is intended for for planting but you look at bringing in diversity in terms of bringing about a change and um in some instances that crop diversity or bringing in crops from other families or different types of crops compared to your normal main crop can take place within an ordinary annual year so in other words within an annual cycle um whereby the main crop is still included or part of it um or it can be a year of of rest where your main crop is totally out of the mix and you don't um mix it into that mix or to that uh, bouquet of crops which you intend planting that year yeah so in a nutshell just basically in basic terms that that would be what um crop diversification is and why it's important for South Africa i think obviously there are numerous benefits for it um what it also does is uh, it also reduces firstly risk i think which is something which we cannot run away from as agriculturalists or farmers if you're constantly going to be planting the same thing over and over there are numerous risk in terms of market um risk in terms of the market being flooded and if you're constantly going for the same crop um there's obviously that possibility of the market being flooded and if the market is flooded obviously that's going to have a negative impact in terms of 
your price, um, how much market share you firstly get and the, the market price which you are able to obtain. There are also enormous risk um, if you are going to move away from uh, incorporating or coming up with crop diversification and planting the very same crop. You are constantly uh, pested by the same pest, the diseases. So those are some of the things which you are trying to break away from and break those crop diseases and pest diseases by bringing in a different type of crop which comes from a different family um, from compared to your main crop to confuse the enemy as they call it to make sure that you give obviously your souls um, a bit of rejuvenation and lifeline and to break away and break those disease and pest cycles and I think in bringing crop diversification into the mix as well you in, in most instances, if you're going to incorporate a legume as well within your crop diversification, it's going to be bringing something else as well as what crop diversification will do for you is it doesn't necessarily take away the very same elements or nutrients um, as compared to somebody who's going to be plant, planting year after year the same crop. Thank you. So yeah, you've actually answered so many of our other talking points and questions, but I think we can definitely break it down even further um, as the conversation goes on. Um, I'd like to bring you back into the conversation, Gahi. So just in terms of, you know, your aspects of the benefits of crop diversification, um, any any aspects that, that Tia may have missed, um, also just your take on it as an agronomist. Um, and then, yeah, just to talk about, that aspect of it and also how it impacts food security in the country um, and also an income for farmers because um, that's always the end game like how do i make more money um, i'm running a business more than anything else um, and how does crop diversification do that yes thanks i think sia has said mouthful and quite uh, very informative so essentially when you want to do your crop diversification what is most important, especially for us farmers, because farming is business, we are looking at uh, diversifying our um, uh, income streams. I mean, if we've got your, 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 your maize there and you also have some vegetables, the vegetable you can harvest within three months, the other ones you wait for, you know, nine months, and you also have other, either your livestock or you can use the manure. So, so from, from, from a financial point of view, from a different income stream point of view, it's very crucial. And now again, we, we talk about uh, now this climate change, um, it, it, it's causing quite a lot of problems in terms of our water resources are becoming scarce. I mean, there's, there's, there's just so many aspects of biotic and biotic factors that have been affected by the, 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 the climate change. So with your diversification, then you improve your soil structures. You also uh, break in the, the pests, uh, 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 I mean, build up in your soils because now different crops will then be attacked by different uh, pests and also diseases. So, and what is also mostly important is you are diversifying your markets. Um, the other crops are ready at a different time. So, so in the context of South Africa, uh, compared to the rest of, of, of the world, we are still better off because um, if you, you have been looking around, uh, other countries are actually experiencing the, the most, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what you call them, this uh, new uh, El Nino phenomenon that are happening. And for us, obviously, it's just to actually prepare in advance that uh, before all of these things start happening, we are in a better position as far as food security is concerned. And, uh, and yeah, I, I mean, we are in farming to make money. We are not, we do love what we do. We love our crops, we love our animals, but most, the bottom line, it's, uh, it's uh, do you make money? So I think, exactly. yeah, that, that's my submission, yeah. Do you make money? That's a big question. <laughs> can't be out here big, at a loss, you know, that's, that's the big thing. Um, yeah, I just want to, there's a question here from one of um, uh, the people attending this, this live. Um, yes. is saying, for one to be able to keep changing the crops they grow, how do they know if the soil you want to plant is suitable for that specific crop? 
Um, you want to take this one, Kahiso, and then, yeah, is that able, something that you yes. are able to answer? Yeah. Yes, I think the, the first thing that you do, obviously, before you plant any crop in your area, um, when you go to your cooperatives, your barrels, and other guys that sell seeds and stuff, you'd want to know which variety is best suited for your area. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to do soil test to look at the, the so that you can do nutrient balance. What does your crop need and what do you have on your soil and whether mm -hmm. the soil is suitable or not. So I think across uh, the, the country, the Agriculture Research Council, they've got a division where they do the soil test. And I think even the private labs, they are not really expensive. At most, you'll pay about 200 rands for, for, for your Mm -hmm. for your sampling but uh, for you to get maximum um, uh, knowledge out of what your soil has i think it's also important just to consult uh, an agronomist or mm -hmm. one of your um, agriculture advisors within your area so that they can advise on what is the best crop to put in your in your land but also you need to be very observant what your neighbors plant it means it has been proven that it can grow well in your area so that's a one one uh, simple uh, uh, way to to know whether your area is good for which crops. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think Sia also responded um, to the question in the chat box. So thanks so much for that, Sia. Um, we have you both of my speakers have touched on this question already, but I just want to throw it out there just to be sure that everyone kind of understands it. How does crop diversification contribute to the resilience of South Africa's agricultural system in the face of climate change? and these extreme weather conditions. Um, maybe if you can just touch on that again briefly, Sia, and then also just to give some clarity around, you know, what do we refer to when we talk about these extreme weather conditions? Is it the hailstorms that comes randomly, the floods? Like, what are we actually talking about? Because I think a lot of these terms and terminology, we talk about climate change, and it's such a big word, but what does it actually mean? You know, let's, let's break that down a little bit as well, please. Okay, sure. No, I think... Um... Obviously, I think crop diversification certainly contributes to our resilience as a country. And um, one of the reasons I say that is that um, we are definitely not a, a one-stream a one stream band where we are a country which is known to be, only be able to produce a certain type of crops. So we are able to show diversity um, as a country in terms of the natural resources we have and that obviously promotes our country being suited to crop diversification and what does that does for us as a country is obviously as farmers we're going to be diversifying with different crops at different times of 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 the year to start off with and different crops will be diversifying over different years so um, when some crop, some farmers will incorporate legumes in the form of soya beans or another one in the form of cowpeas or in the form of uh, dry beans. Others will obviously be diversifying their crops, moving from maize and uh, doing potato and so forth. What that does is obviously it ensures that as a country or as a farming sector, if there's a disaster of some form and um, perhaps there's strong significance or an outbreak of a certain disease which hits out on a certain crop obviously those who have been fortunate and diversified to another crop are obviously not as hard hit what it also does in terms of crop diversification the resilience it shows for us as a country is that if farmers are able to grow and diversify with different types of crops it also eliminates or reduces the amount of dependency in terms of us needing to import different types of crops which we perhaps are shy of planting or have been neglecting and what that obviously does is us promoting a proudly south african product being purchased or utilized by society or the community and um, what it also shows in us being able to diversify is us in a, as an agricultural sector moving with the changing times and um, climatic change is big. What climatic change is, is obviously how things have changed from the norm and standard way in which 
we've been taught or have believed things to be. Um, you'll see that what are we being given by the mighty creator nowadays is becoming very extreme. When there's no rain, there's no rain. When there is rain, there's a lot of rain. It's becoming much more hot and humid. And obviously that's having an impact and requiring farmers and agriculturists to obviously increase and check up their game and be more stringent in their practices and principles. Obviously with a more humid society or a more humid environment, there's going to be an increase in pests and diseases and it's going to call on farmers not to take shortcuts if they're going to look after or be able to nurture a crop appropriately throughout the season. What climate change and the likes of El Nino have also done is that our rainfalls are late in coming if they do come. And um, when they do come, they're also not what we normally used to or in terms of quantity or there's just too much. And you must remember as farmers when the soil is too wet or there's too much water, there's not much you can do. You need the soil to, 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 to dry up in order for you to be able to 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 be arable because if you go in there and start your land preparation and the soil is too wet you're obviously also asking for problems there's going to be a lot of compaction and there might actually be the aspect where the the seed which you've planted or the seedlings the root cavities are exposed to so much moisture that they don't germinate as quickly as they could have or they rot in that extent and they don't grow appropriately so Obviously, in us diversifying, we're also trying as farmers to run away from, obviously, the negative impact of, of that climate change. In the norm, we were taught that from the 15th of October, you'd be able to plant, obviously, um, in the past, your, your, your normal summer crops. But I think with changing times, in most instances, come the 15th of October, there's, there's still a risk of us experiencing a cold spell or we haven't received enough spring rains yet to be confident enough to put seed down because i think um what soil is it's it's a bank but you've got to play and bank your money or your seed at the right time and and reduce your risk yeah thank you is there anything you want to add to that question maybe no, I think you you have said mouthful you have covered all the aspects i mean yeah like you are saying we used to have a, a planting calendar, but now it doesn't work. We really have to be very observant of when does Mother Nature decides to give us rain and what are our moisture levels and obviously using the resources that we've got to predict uh, when are we going to have the second rain and all of those things. And I think um, the breeders are also doing their utmost best in, in as far as... Um, developing new varieties that are can actually be suitable for the conditions that we are in now. So, so we, we need quite a lot of uh, uh, developments of new varieties, new cultivars to, to actually be able to plant into the future. Because how we do our business, where we are now, we have thought about this thing perhaps five years ago or ten years ago. So what needs to be planted in the coming few years it's what now the researchers are still busy with. Okay, so this person is saying I'm a black soldier fly farmer looking at supplying crop growers with organic fresh fertilizer, um, but have noticed that a lot of farmers need education around its benefits. I've actually done a podcast on the black soldier fly on Farmers Inside Track. I would love to know more about what you're doing. Please DM me, Don Numdu. Um, the input from Zanzi. I'd love to have that topic on this space, Gather to Grow. I think there's loads of benefits, and I'm sure we can expand on that. There's also another question here from Matipa saying, how much rain should we wait for before starting to plant? I don't know who wants to take this. Um, thanks, Malik, for saying this live is so informative. Is it possible to save it for later? Yeah, so all of these sessions are on Food from Zanzi's Instagram afterwards. Uh, you can just go back and listen to it. Uh, I love all the engagement. Thank you so much. Um, cool. Anyone want to respond to the question about how much rain we should wait for before we start to plant? Um, Sia or Kahisa, you guys can either one who switch on the camera first or you can just respond via text. But the, the conversation is always like when you get to... Um, yeah, Kahisa, you can go. 
I think I'll allow Sia to go and, and address it, yeah. Okay. The other question is also asking from the same person, I think, should we be moving to more commercial seeds that do focus on maximizing yield and I guess are more advanced uh, but can only be used once? Yeah, that's the other thing. Like, um, I've heard a lot of people saying, like, you know, creating your own seed bank and reusing seeds is actually not as good as, it's, it's actually not a good practice to have unless you're like a subsistence farmer or backyard home grower, but on a commercial scale, that's not really good. Um, Kachisa, maybe you can just um, share your take on that. Yes, I think in the in the older days, maybe 15, 20 years ago, you could be able to do that because we had organic seeds. The ones that we have now that have been called organic seeds are actually certified organic seeds. Okay, what? So I doubt... <laughs> Explain this thing to me. Because you, there are standards. You standardize how how a particular uh, seeds have been uh, 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 engineered. Okay. So you, you you limit quite a lot of uh, um, uh, your, your 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 artificial you know genetics that you are going to put into the seeds. But at the current moment, I don't think it's going to be very mm. feasible. For people to be using uh, their, their their bank seats, I mean, uh, we should be looking at commercial scales. And um, this is that we buy now; they are hybrids. Mm. So once you plant it, and then for the next coming season, if you were to repeat it, you will probably get um, of the yield been reduced. So I would not advise anybody to reuse their seats. Unless uh, maybe wherever you have bought them, they've given you um, an assurance that you'll still at least get about 80% of germination for that seed. But if they've not made that declaration, then you you should just avoid using those seeds. Yeah. And then there was the other question, Kahisa, around um, how much rain we should wait for before we starting before we start planting. Uh, does it does does it, does it matter which region this person is in? Um, Sia, do you want to take this one? Sure. Oh, yeah. No, with, with, uh, with the quantity, I don't think there's a figure we can give out. I think with experience and time, you learn. I think if obviously you've only got or received about 10 millimeters of rainfall and it's this time of the year and the amount of sunshine and sun hours you're getting, I mean, that disappears in no time. But what's what's primarily being advocated there is, is just to look around and see how much rainfall you're getting has it started being consistent to start off with and there are various things which you can look around and see around you you look at the color of the grass to start off with that's a, that's an indicator of the amount of moisture if if the grass around and you know that you're in an area with very harsh winters and so forth and you can see that the color of the grass is starting to change and so forth um, that's also an indication. However, I think if you look and study your climate over time and, and what South Africa has become in a lot of the areas, um, you're finding a lot of the areas receiving a cold spell in October. So with a lot of people, it's only becoming safe to plant from the 15th of November backwards because you're trying to, to, to uh, obtain as much of a safety net as possible because can you imagine you even if you've got 30 hectares and you put down mm -hmm. your seed on the 15th of September, it germinates within a week or 10, 10 days, and then all of a sudden, boom, you are hit in the first week of October, uh, frost, either frost or it snows, and you lose that crop because you've either been a bit impatient or you're trying to, 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 to reap as much as you can out of the market, whereby there are farmers who, who believe that they can get two green millies or green maize harvest <laughs> in a year yeah. before winter comes in. If they, plant, if they plant a cultivar, which is a short cultivar of three months, either 90 mm -hmm. days or 105 days, and, and there's some of them who strike it lucky and are able to do so, but you've also got to measure your risk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we've trailed a bit with the conversation. Kakhisa, did you want to add something? 
the topic is yeah. soil crop diversification. I think mm. the questioning and all the questions around climate and climate changing yes. and resources is just kind of yeah. quite important and it's quite relevant. You know, with farmers, some they believe they have more belief than others, so they always believe in magic. <laughs> that, <laughs> but I think what is most important, I think farmers need to link up with the um, uh, um, uh, suppliers who where they normally buy seeds. Yeah. These guys have been in, in the industry for quite long, yeah. and they yeah. actually save more farmers within your area. So they always know, uh, uh, they can always advise that you know, with the current culture that we have, you rather wait until it rains again, or we rather wait for the for these heavy rains to pass, for, for whatever reason, then I think at getting advice from your 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 seed supplier is quite important in this regard. Thanks. Yeah, just on that point, actually, I heard someone saying to not always listen to seed suppliers because they want to make their money themselves. So there's there's always that tricky thing with that situation. Like I think it was last week or the week before. So I was like, but you have to be sure who to listen to and when to listen to them. Okay. Look, here's another question. Before you pass, I think we are we are living in a world where it's like Google. You garbage in, garbage out. So so depending on what kind of question are you asking it to then determine what kind of question do you get back. And actually even the reliability of, of such people. So we're not just talking about random people who are in the shops. We are talking about real people who actually work hand in hand with farmers with farming organizations. So it's also important for farmer not just to be alone and be associated with other farmers within his or her area. Then it, yeah. it actually eliminates the risk of uh, seed suppliers who are just mischievous. Yeah, definitely, I couldn't agree more. There's another question here from Matipa saying, how do we advocate crop diversification when, for example, we're dealing with smallholder farmers that can only experience I can only experience what only has experience with a particular crop. Um, I think that's a very important question. Um, yeah, how would you how would you best respond to this one? Because Adipa is asking, how do we advocate crop diversification when a smallholder farmer is only experienced with one specific crop? Um, yeah, how do we do that? Do you just play? Do you just try it out? Do you just like start with it? I mean, what's the best way to go about it? I think I think sorry if I can come in. I think one of the best things is um, obviously if somebody has for decades or for moon ages has been planting or practicing maize, and they believe that's the that's the crop for them, it it gives them six and a half tons per hectare, and um, all of a sudden you you tr start talking to them about soya bean and they are only thinking of two and a half tons per hectare. They're not sure who they're going to sell it to. Um, there's, you find that there are a lot of bylaws which are very stringent in terms of where and how they can um, sell it to and, and, and who. Um, the best I always say is for somebody who is in that sort of uh, limbo, that you, it's fine. You advise them to stay with their main crop. They continue with their maize. And this just ask for either a quarter of a hectare on, on one of their hectares and, 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 and try and promote that they do bring in that diversification um, with obviously perhaps a legume crop. And they compare and contrast. For instance, with your crop diversification, if you've incorporated obviously a legume over time, there's going to be a reduction in terms of need for nitrogen fertilizer, for them to use LAN or urea, something which is going to give them N. And then that gets people thinking. Another thing as well is obviously incorporating a crop diversification or a crop which is going to perhaps give you some soil cover and, and looking at the impact of that and comparing where you've practiced crop diversification with crops where or an area, part of the land where you haven't practiced crop diversification and comparing, because obviously where you've perhaps either used a cover crop or a crop which has diversified and look after and covered the soil more, there's going to be more moisture compared to a soil which has either been left bare or the type of crop which you have planted there hasn't 
given as much soil cover. And I think Kakhiso will advocate to this. I think we learn by talking to each other and visiting each other as well and seeing what other people are doing. And there's constantly a lot of farmers day where you, I might not have time to play around as a farmer. However, ARC or my national or my local provincial department might, might, might have those sort of trials to try and expose myself and, 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 and expose myself and invite people, whether it's an extension officer to come and look at what I'm doing or, or, or even ARC. There's a lot of advisory services which are available and be part and parcel of study groups. You know, the amount of information people share by talking. Mm-hmm. Even on, on these sort of platforms, whether it's WhatsApp, if you, you've you got a group of five or ten farmers and you share on a weekly basis what is happening on your farm, you, you get so much insight and, 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 and so forth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Definitely. Uh, we only have about 15 minutes left. Um, this hour really does go by pretty fast. And I know um, my guest is, looks a bit, are you guys still good? I just want to make sure that you're still good. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, now let's talk about the challenges. You know, um, is it just all great with diversification, or are there actual challenges with it? Um, because again, people are always like, "Oh, you have to diversify. It's the best thing for you." But you know, what are the challenges? Let's talk about the major challenges and the barriers of it, and what do farmers face day to day with it? Um, Kalisa, do you want to start off with this one? Yes, um, I think from 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 a business perspective, diversification is quite important, but that has um, other challenges, or rather, you might have challenges as a farmer. Either you don't have enough land mm-hmm. to do different crops at a profitable level, mm-hmm. because there is no point in you splitting your maize on a 30 hectares and, and soya on another 30 hectares, both of them you are just not going to break even. So that might be mm-hmm. a difficulty. But as far as when you have enough land and, and, and it allows you to, to, to move around, even, I mean, incorporating your diversific- diversification with your crop rotation, then you are able to do so. You benefit from the nitrogen that has been, you know, um, fixed by the legume into your soils. And and I mean now you are you are getting even different markets because if you have if you have observed there are farmers who actually look at the markets before they plant anything. Mm. This farmer plants sorghum this year. As we look at the trends, we see that uh, production of sorghum has went down in the previous season. So obviously in the coming season mm. there will be more demand. So now we are playing economics, the supply mm. and demand. There there are few farmers who have planted uh, the the sorghum. So I'm gonna make a thousand rand more so i just abandoned the other crop so when when you look at diversification in terms of your uh, um, uh, the, your bottom lines your margins then it makes more sense mm. but for smallholder farmers it's really just about sustainability using the natural resources to the best uh, uh, of of i mean you can use the best of what you have mm. um because when you look at diversific- but diversification from a smallholder point of view, they've actually been doing this for years. Mm. Crop rotation has been done, I mean, uh, intercrop has been done for years from our farmers using the indigenous knowledge system. They just had a way that they knew that they need to put maize and, 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 and a legume together. So, mm. so those are the, the pros and cons. It's just the issue of limitations of uh, the size of your land, uh, your operations where are you gonna make are you gonna break even when you were to diversify your 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 produce other than that i don't see much uh shortcomings when it comes to diversification it's actually more beneficial than when you're doing mono uh, culture or doing just one enterprise in your business yeah Sia, do you agree with that statement? And also, do you have any advice in terms of regions that might be better for diversification? And are there issues with other regions being more of a challenge? Um, And then I want to talk about government policies after this as well. Sia, do you? I agree with Kahi. So I think the main deciding um, leveraging aspects is that of land. 
if I've only got a hectare or, or even some people, even 10 hectares. And, and, and if I've constantly been doing maize on that and um, I'm getting six tons per hectare and a ton is going for maize at, at perhaps maybe I'm only getting 3,000 rand and it's, 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 it's 18,000. It's 18,000 per hectare. Mm -hmm. Then somebody advises me to diversify my sometimes the yield of the crop i've diversified is less the market price is less then i start weighing and 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 thinking of do i really want these so-called properties which are going to improve because of diversification my nutrient status of the soil breaking my disease cycle breaking my pest if instead of eighteen thousand, which i was getting Per, per hectare of maize, I'm now perhaps only getting 10 for soybean per hectare because it's a low yielding thing. So it's it's also got to do with sustainability. If you've got a long-term vision in terms of you'd like these natural resources which you're working with to not only look after you, but to also look after your grandchildren and your children who are hopefully going to farm the, the, the same soil or same farm later, um, it is. It, it it will definitely be an option, but nobody can force you. It's an it's an ethical thing, and it's taking time. It's just like the common debate of conventional tillage or conservational tillage. Some people will tell you we'll never move away from the tried and test tried and tested. When the soil is tired, we'll add what we need to add to it. If it means that I need to be spending fifteen thousand per hectare. Um, to resuscitate it, I'd rather do that than than sacrificing my yield. So it's definitely one, one of those aspects. And I think when you touch on legislation and public sector, I think there's obviously been an increase in terms of awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there's definitely no legislation which I know which is cast in stone, which forces people to 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 stick or or adopt diversification. But there are obviously a lot of incentives here and there, and there are also a lot of trials which have come in. Um, a lot of conservational societies and clubs which are giving farmers a lot of inputs to to adopt these, and obviously. I've got to see something somewhere work for someone before I am tempted to do it. If I'm only hearing about it, but I've never seen it, um, it's very difficult to, to, to sift over. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I don't want to miss, miss any of the, of the comments here. Um, uh, Matipa is saying incorporating companion planting could, be e could also be an easy a way to ease into diversity. Um, good point. I think that was also just uh, mentioned by Pachis so briefly. And then Nkosanati saying, great platform and very knowledgeable speakers. I agree 100%. Um, first time attending this platform, and I believe it could be beneficial for farmers and they could easily access it. That is exactly why I love doing this. I'm with you now twice a month. I used to do it once a week. Um, I miss it though, just being here on this platform, by the way. Um, but, but yeah, I agree. This is a great space to learn. It's called Gather to Grow. If you haven't been here before, thank you for joining for the first time. Hope that you'll be back the next time I'm here. Um, the next topic I'll mention towards the end of the session. Um, Kahiso, I don't want to like um, leave you out of the part around government policies and support programs. I think the work that you guys are doing with YARD and all of these other organizations is also very important to kind of change farmers thinking around you know this topic specifically and just generally around farming practices and how it is changing and how it's important for us to change our thinking i think there's a very strong role that those advocacy groups and farming groups and organizations play within the sector right yes there is a there is a slogan or a saying in in our veneg it says how will you get it when you are just sitting in your own corner <laughs> So getting involved in these kind of platforms and uh, farming organizations, it actually does help. And I know for a fact that government has quite a lot of policies that they advocate for people to adopt. Like CIA said, it's not a must, but um, they, there's quite a lot of stuff that they are doing. I know 
we once ran a, a huge program in, in Bronco Sprite here in Pretoria mm -hmm. where they were testing um, um, uh, soya bean variety. So they did some trials and people will come and compare and actually see, oh, this one is actually doing well. So those who are even the BT maize have been done, the trials have been there. So I think we just need more of uh, showcasing where people can actually see that this does work. But again, like Sia said, this is a, you, need to, you need to make a conscious decision. It's an ethical thing to do, because if we just use our natural resources the way we want, then, I mean, we are just uh, depleting life on mm -hmm. Earth. We may as well start thinking of going to move to Mars and see if there's <laughs> life there. And I don't think we can do that. <laughs> Not yet, at least. Although I saw that there's an Earth-like planet that they discovered in the solar system now. So I was like, okay, what's happening here? Are we going to try to move there? <laughs> but, the, yeah. just the, the other rich guys, <laughs> if they come back, <laughs> we, might think yeah. of, we might think of finding food there. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, thanks for these sessions. Very good eye-open and also good in challenging the way things are always done, especially with the change changes happening around. No, thank you so much. We'll continue to have these conversations. Okay, my last two questions is just around technology and innovation that we can kind of use or leverage to facilitate crop diversification in South Africa. And then we'll, I just want to talk about future trends as the two closing, um, you know, questions for this, for this live. And then I'll tell you more about my next session, which is going to be on the 4th of October. But um, I think you guys Guys can just split those two questions. See, I maybe you want to take the tech one, and then Kahiso can end off with just like, watch why should people really consider this, and what is the future trends we could be looking at? Um, yeah, yeah, you can go. I think obviously technology is is a norm. The buzzword out there is we are entering if we are not already in uh, the fifth industrial revolution, and um, what obviously that has done for us is. Uh, it's making a turnaround time in terms of our uh, practices and principles and operations being much more rapid. What it's also looking at is what technology is going to be able to do for us as much as it's high tech and is expensive mm -hmm. is where it can. It's going to take out the risk which was brought about a lot by the heavy machinery which operated and worked the soils and, and, and same principle with diversification. Obviously, if you've worked your soil and um, it's either you've worked it or you're going to plant into an area where you're either going to go no-till or conservational tillage, there's, there's great possibilities in terms of your seed, um, of your crop which you're looking to be diversified, being planted overhead by drone. Um, obviously, you've just got to look at aspects in terms of wind, um, climatic conditions on the day you're looking to plant, and, and a lot of things in terms of your application of pesticides, herbicides, and so forth. And things are becoming more and more mechanized, mechanized in the context where people or farmers are not necessarily needing to be on the farm or on the ground where they can control things using various applications and apps. And um, I mean, you, you're able to send a drone out to look at what your crop is looking like and do remote censoring and send you pictures. And that's obviously if it's linked to appropriate apps, it's able to advise you in terms of various things and nutrient deficiency by looking just at the foot of a crop where you're not necessarily needing to be there but um, it's able to tell you what your crop is deficient of or the growth stage it's at. Do you want to take the, do you want to just wrap up what you were saying and then take the next question around trends and then I'm literally googling okay see us back. Sorry about okay. that. Um, so yeah, it, it's one of those things. What I always say is though we must be careful that uh, technology doesn't create what we used to call in the 90s or early 2000s, bucky farmers, people who farm um, sitting in the bucky with only just the, the right hand arm or elbow having a different color to the rest of the body because that's the only part of the body which actually gets to feel the sunshine. The rest of the stuff is in the bucky. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah,
So. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the, there's quite a huge risk with that kind of farming. In as much as we are going to, we appreciate technology and in what it does in making our life quite easy. We also don't need to abuse it to a point where we're going to lose money. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you need to go and see your crop. You need to look at uh, your crop and your, you need to speak to your plants. You, there's no way you'll farm in something and just sending your throne to irrigate. I tell you, they are not going to grow, down. They are not going to grow. <laughs> you need to go and speak to your crops, speak life into them. Yeah. But what is really more important is these trends where we do our fertigation, we do pesticides application through drones, and we're actually able to do soil mapping. You are able to irrigate enough water where it's needed. So, so, so that's where the, the beauty of technology comes in. Um, you have mm -hmm. seen with these huge rains that we just experienced in the past uh, two seasons, we're able to do our uh, and, and fertigation through drones and, and that has been very successful and farmers who could not afford or did not even in fact give uh, um, a, 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 I mean give drones a try they actually lost money in that regard so so those are the kind of trends where we are going now but the traditional way of farming in terms of visiting your farm being physically there those one can be taken away. We really need to see what's happening on the ground. We need to see and feel our soils. Yeah. Because that's what the drones will not do for you. They will not speak yeah. to your prop, props on your behalf. You really need to be there physically. Yes. I love that. I remember someone saying something around uh, the best way to know your, it's like walk, something around walking through your crops is the best reading. I don't know what, what the statement was, but I thought it was really cool. I can't even remember the quote exactly. I'll definitely try and think about it. I think it was on one of these Gather to Grow sessions. Yeah. They, uh, there's they another said, question. Yeah, you can go see yeah, it. They said, that, they said the best fertilizer for your crop or pastures is your footprints. Yes, yes that's exactly what it was. <laughs> I remember. Did, did you say it? Was that you? I hope it was No, it no, it, it, it definitely <laughs> wasn't me. No, no, no. Okay, cool. um, another question. Around, I think the person was commenting on my tech question around, you know, good question. Last one from me is, Is that, are there any um, AI concepts that you know of around crop growing? I basically just Googled it quickly. There is some. There's how AI is cropping up in agriculture. There's a Forbes article. Maybe that's a good topic to have later. Cool. I think we've wrapped up most of my questions. I just want to talk briefly around my next topic, which is going to be on the 4th of October. It's going to be around the magic of sorghum farming in Mzanzi from fields to feast. So hopefully we talk more about, about uh, sorghum farming in South Africa. We discover the versatility of this crop, how it's sustainable and how it thrives, um, more to do with the growth aspect, you know, how you can get into it. Maybe you can even diversify with it. Is it something you can diversify with? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, and then the next one after that is going to be on the 18th of October, which is around unlocking the power of value addition in agriculture. So why processing matters. Um, I hope that you guys will join me for that as well. Um, so like I mentioned, we're down to two a month on these on this platform specifically. I do miss the weekly sessions, but I think this still adds a lot of value. Um, I'd like to thank my guests and just get them to share one last comment from their side. Also, how people can connect with you. I think it's so important just to, um, again, tell them who you are, because I think people joined in and out of this conversation as we wrap up. Thanks. I think I'll start with you, um, Kahiso, and then we'll move over to Sia. Thanks. No, thanks, Don, for inviting us. And um, yeah, I, I still do uh, um, uh, uh, mixed farming. I do goats. It's we're at a commercial level now, and uh, goat sheep. And I also do maize and soya. So, but yeah, I've been involved quite a lot into youth uh, development in farming, and uh, even on the policy development. We have worked with the FAO together with the National Department of Agriculture. There's quite a lot of work that we do and people don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, we also play a significant role in development of this uh, 
uh, master plans that are now the talk of the town. Uh, the poultry one, to be more specific, people were very agitative and say, no, there's been a lot of support on the, we don't need to develop new funds. And guess what? Now people are getting money, getting funded out of it. So, so I think surrounding yourself with people who are within your sector that might know more than you do. Mm -hmm. And at times people just don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. So to tune in into this platform and just listen, you might learn one or two things like I've learned mm -hmm. today. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, just your last words uh, for us. Any advice generally that you'd like to share? I think the best thing is no matter how big it looks, you start somewhere. Yeah. It's always best for somebody when they ask for assistance that they've got something which they can show you that they've tried so that you've got something to work with rather than being at scratch. And I think the opportunities out there uh, also, also always say to somebody, um, people who say they're looking for funding and so forth, the first question you get from people who are funders and have money to um, incorporate into agriculture or agriculturalists is, what are you doing? Take us to what you've done and started. And because um, it's always best and, 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 and more conducive to put money or backing behind somebody who's at least started with what they have. And um, yeah, let's go out there and make the most out of it. Our country needs us and uh, we need to ensure that South Africa becomes and remains um, food stable and we become food secure. Um, there's great risk of us needing to import a lot of the stuff we consume uh, whilst the population is growing on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining. If you've been here from the beginning, I appreciate that. Um, thank you to my guests. Thank you to everyone who contributed. Appreciate you. I, I do this because I love agriculture so much. Bye, everybody. Thanks.